right here in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 12. It reads like this, and I believe this is a word that you could get a hold of for yourself this morning. It says, the seed will grow well. The vine will yield its fruit. The ground will produce its crops. And the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. And just as you, Judah and Israel, have been a curse among the nations or a burden, so I will save you and you will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. Do you receive that word this morning? Turn to your neighbor and tell him, let your hands be strong. And you may be seated. You know, this was such a pivotal time within Israel. This was such a pivotal time within Judah. This was actually a time where the two nations were uniting together once again. For a long time, these two nations were divided. After uh, David was king and Solomon was king and, and they began to, uh, the kingdom began to divide. They be divided within the northern and the southern tribes, Judah and Israel began to divide. But when they were in captivity, it was a, a word that was given to them by the prophet Jeremiah. And, and he told them that for 70 years, you're going to be in captivity because of disobedience because you've turned to pagan idols, you're going to be in captivity, not just for a few years, but for 70 years. But how many know when we serve God, how many know there's always hope? There's always a process. See, we can't forget about the process. We can't forget about the journey. We can't forget about the things that happen along the way to the promise. And this is why it's so important for us to understand this because you have to understand that throughout history, wherever the people of God went, they prospered. Wherever the people of God went, they became the strongest in the land. You know, right now, we're, and I thank God for this, that we're in the one-year Bible. How many thank God or how many are still in the one-year Bible? Come on, wave your hand. If you're not or if you fell off, there's still time. Come on, somebody. And I just want to encourage you because, you know, we begin to read, you know, in Genesis, we begin to read about the journey. We begin to read about the story of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, and their journey, and their process. And we begin to see how, how, how they prospered in the land of Canaan. They prospered in a place that wasn't their own. God still prospered them. God still strengthened them. God was still giving them everything that they needed and more in the land of Canaan. We also see that Joseph and his brothers, when they were in Egypt, were fruitful and increased greatly. We begin to look at in the promised land after uh, their time in the desert that they prospered and they began to occupy the land. We see that even in the city of Jerusalem, they began to prosper. Even while they were in captivity in Babylon, they multiplied and they began to purchase homes. But during this time, their city was in ruin. During this time, their city was destroyed. While they were in captivity for these 70 years, while they were in captivity in Babylon, their city, their home, their temple was destroyed, was in ruins. So God began to uh, once again give visions, and God began to once again bring hope, and God began to once again speak through his prophets, and he began to tell his prophets that I'm going to bless my people once again. I'm going to strengthen my people once again. How many thank God that his word will always encourage and always strengthen and always give us the hope that we need to continue to do what he's called us to do? And that's what he was doing through these men. He was letting them know, don't worry, the blessing is coming. 
Don't worry, the resources are coming. Don't worry, God's plan is coming. Don't worry, the miracle is going to happen. Don't worry, God is going to fulfill his word that he gave to you. He's telling them, don't worry, I am going to save you, and you're going to be a blessing. As God was speaking through Zechariah and as God was speaking through his people, the people began to get excited once again. The people begin to get motivated once again. As a matter of fact, Zerubbabel, the first leader, the man that, that led the first group of people back to the ruined city of Jerusalem, the Bible said that he got revived once again. I mean, imagine going back to your home. Imagine going back to your city and the city is totally in ruins. Your home is totally destroyed. Just imagine that. Just picture that. At first, they were motivated. At first, they were excited. But after a while, they kind of got discouraged. How many know after a while, sometimes the enemy will try to discourage his people? Because when discouragement can take root, it can disconnect us from the plan of God. When discouragement can take root, it can begin to disconnect us with the agenda of God. But how many thank God for his word? His word brings life. His word brings hope. His word is all that we need. And, and as the word of the Lord began to be uh, shared with God's people once again, they begin to get hopeful once again. They begin to get excited once again. They begin to get motivated once again for the work that God had for them to rebuild their city. You know what Zechariah was telling them? The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. You know what he was telling them right here in these two verses? He was telling them, as long as you focus on building the house of the Lord, you will experience increased peace, increased harvest, increased favor, increased resources, increased protection. Is there anybody in this place uh, that is getting a hold of God's word for your life this morning? That as long as you focus on God and his purpose and his house and his mission, then he is going to increase. Increase your life. But the question is, are you prepared for it? Have you been preparing? Have you been preparing? I think that's so important for us to ask because during this time, you know, when the people of God began to get a little discouraged, there was a man that God raised up. He was a young man. While God, while the people of God were discouraged there in the ruined city of Jerusalem, back in the Persian Empire, there was a man that was getting prepared. A man that we all know as Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we know he was a cupbearer. Little did we know he was going to become God's construction worker. Nehemiah was in a, had a good place. Nehemiah didn't have to worry about anything. He had everything that he needed. He was eating the king's food, drinking the king's drinks, living in the king's quarters. He had everything that, he was the most trusted person next to a pagan king. And when he heard the news that the people of God were discouraged. And when he heard the news that the walls of Jerusalem were ruined, it began to do something inside of him. See, you know you have a vision from God when it benefits the life of others. You know you have a calling. You know you have a purpose. You know that God is beginning to separate your life when he begins to put a burden and he begins to allow you to see what he sees and he begins to prepare you to be the answer to someone's prayer. God began to prepare him. He was in a good place. You could say he even had a good career. 
He was the most trusted. He was a governor. He was the most trusted person in the palace. You had to be a trusted person in order to be a, a cupbearer. And he was the most trusted person, and he was in this place, and, and God's hand was with him, but he began to develop a burden. He says, I'm in a good place. I'm, in a, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm eating good. I'm, I'm living good. I'm, I'm doing okay, but, but there's a need. There's a need. And that's so important for us to understand. You know, sometimes we can say, man, I'm I'm Okay. Sometimes we can say, I'm, in, I'm okay, I'm in a good place. My finances is, is, is good, my, my family's doing okay, you know. I'm in a, in a good place, but I'm here to let you know this morning that God has more. I'm here to let you know this morning that God has more for your life. I'm here to let you know that you may be the answer to someone's prayer. You may be the answer to someone's cry. You may be the answer. Somebody is probably saying, you know what? I need somebody to come in and minister to my family. I need somebody to begin to open up their homes. I need somebody to begin to open up their hearts. Because once that happens, then you're going to expand the harvest. You're part of the solution. You are the plan. There's no plan B in the kingdom of God. We're the plan. We're the plan. There's no backup plan. Tell your neighbor, you're the plan. Tell your neighbor, I'm the plan. We're the solution. So Nehemiah was given the responsibility to go back and to rebuild the walls. Now, why was this important? It's important because Jerusalem is important. See, any time a nation wanted to expand in the Middle East, the first city they needed to conquer was Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the bridge. Jerusalem was the power. Jerusalem is self-sufficient. So in order to expand in this part of the world, you needed to conquer Jerusalem. Because if you conquered Jerusalem, you had the power. You had the power to expand. You had the power to grow. Did you know that Jerusalem has been attacked by 53 nations? But God's people till this day have been able to prevail. Come on, after thousands and thousands of years, after war and after, you know, you know, being conquered, God's people, it's still ruined today. The land belongs to his people. The land belongs to God. So it's a strategic city. And here Zechariah is telling them, the harvest is coming. Increased peace is coming. Increased joy is coming. Resources are coming. But if they don't have no walls, they can't keep the harvest. Without walls, they can't preserve what God was about to do within the city, within the people. So that's why it was such a burden, and that's why it was such a cry where when the walls were ruined and the walls were torn down, they began to realize we got to get those walls back up. See, there's healthy walls and there's unhealthy walls. Unhealthy walls build barriers. Healthy walls build bridges. They're beneficial. Healthy walls are beneficial. Unhealthy walls are barriers. These walls were healthy. These walls, if you begin to look at where Jerusalem is, Jerusalem sits on a hill. It's a city on a hill. It's fully exposed. And the only protection that it has, the first line of defense are the walls. The walls were Jerusalem's army, Jerusalem's dignity, but also it was Jerusalem's way of preserving the harvest. So Nehemiah begins to get the call. Nehemiah begins to get the privilege. Little did he know that he was the answer. 
So how did Nehemiah prepare? Well, the first thing that he did is he prayed. How many know we're a people of prayer? How many know we're a church of prayer? We, we believe in, in prayer. We believe in getting into the presence of God. We believe in, in crying out to God. We, we've seen miracles happen through answered prayer. We're a people of prayer. Whenever you rally God's people, whenever you rally God's church, whenever they hear about a prayer meeting, how many know it's always packed because God's people are hungry for prayer? They're, so, they're hungry for prayer. See, Nehemiah, when he asked about the walls, it wasn't a casual question. It wasn't like when somebody asked you, how are you doing? It was like when somebody asked you, no, really, how are you doing? And when Nehemiah asked about the walls, it, was a, 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 it came from a place of deep concern. But Nehemiah, he just didn't pray for a day. The Bible shows us that Nehemiah prayed for four months. He prayed and he fasted for four months. And as he was preparing, as, as he was praying, God was beginning to give him the plan. See, because a plan from God will always last. Our plans will work. Maybe for a little while, our plans will work. But how many know the plans of God will always last? The plan of God will always last. What does the Bible say? Commit your ways to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Because Nehemiah prayed, God began to give him a plan. He knew how long the project would take. He knew where he was going. He knew what he needed. And he knew that God's hand was going to be with him. See, prayer begins to give you the confidence for the work. Prayer begins to give you the confidence for the task. Because, you know, we can do some things, but how many know he can do all things? I said we could do some things, but how many know we could do all things through, through Christ who gives us the strength? So in prayer, he's building your confidence. In prayer, he's building your courage. In prayer, he's building your commitment. Is there a church that still believes in prayer? We're a people of prayer. In prayer, God begins to give you the confidence. In, in prayer, God begins to give it to you. Do you know why he needed the confidence? Because the last person that took out the king's father was a cupbearer. King Artaxerxes' father was taken out by his cupbearer. So imagine King Artaxerxes and remembering that and seeing Nehemiah. Nehemiah was burdened. Who knows what the king is thinking, right? Maybe the king's thinking like, oh, here we go again. Another plot. Because the last person that was in the presence of my father with the same kind of look took my father out. But the king trusted Nehemiah. The king trusted Nehemiah. And because the king trusted Nehemiah, the king provided for Nehemiah. When the king trusts you, he will always provide for you. When the king trusts you, he will always provide for you. When there is a trust, when there is an agreement, when there is a covenant, when you are consistent, when you are committed, that's why the Bible says don't grow weary when you're doing good because at the right time you shall reap. Don't grow weary. Don't give up. It's coming. There was trust. So he prayed. And because he prayed, he was able to plan. See, the way to prepare for the harvest is we must pray, but how many know we must also have a plan? You must have a plan. When you're expecting a harvest, have a plan. Are you believing for a bigger ministry? Are you believing for a bigger life group? Are you believing for 
a bigger home? Are you believing for a second home? Are you believing to be promoted? Why? Because the Bible says when they see your works, they will give glory to your father. Because they're going to say, man, she didn't politic. He didn't politic. He wasn't cutting corners at the job side and look at how God raised him up. She was always on time. He was always early and and the last one to leave. And and he was faithful and he was consistent. He wasn't always compromising. As soon as God's people begin to compromise, trouble followed. But how many know when we have a plan? How many know when we're in prayer? How many know when we're looking to the king's resources, not man's resources, but the king's resources? The king will always give you what you need. We're a part of his kingdom. We are the king's kids. We are not just subjects. We are sons and daughters. So what does that mean when you're a son and daughter of the king? That means you have a part in the inheritance. That means that you are a steward. That means that even though he owns it, your job is to rule it. He's going to give us what we need. He's going to give us what we need, but he's also going to give us what we prepare for. What we prepare for. That's why it's so important for us to continue to to stay in step with God. To stay in step with this plan. To stay in step. Because the moment that we step out of line, that could be the moment that it can pass you by. What you prepare for, how many know you will keep? The king provided. Provision will always follow the mission. There's only three kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of man. There's only three. All we got to do is pick one. You can't pick one on Sunday and work on the others on Monday. You got to pick one. You got to stick to one. You got to focus on one. You got to pray about one. You got to plan for one. You got to prepare for just one. I'd rather pick the best one. I'd rather pick the one that's going to last. You're not going to be able to take your car with you, your accounts with you, your property with you, even though those things are good and those things God wants to bless you with, but the harvest is bigger than that. The Bible says that he's giving you the ability to produce wealth. What is wealth? Well, wealth is having plenty and abundance. Wealth is having plenty and abundance. It's when your money starts making money. It's when you just don't own a business, but you begin to employ others. And others begin to prosper under you. That's when your money starts making money. When, you, when money is the byproduct, you've achieved wealth. Our goal is not to chase money. Our goal is not to chase the mighty dollar. Our goal is to chase God's purposes. Our goal is to chase God's plan. Our goal is to chase what what God has for your life. Because when you chase that, money becomes the byproduct. God says, oh, he can handle more. Oh, she can handle more. Because she's been in prayer. Because he's been planning. Because they're in my presence, because they've been focused on the mission, because they desire to please me, then the king begins to release his resources. He begins to release it over your life, over your children, over your family. We must pray. We must plan. But lastly, as I get ready to close... 
We must persist. We must persist. We must be persistent in the kingdom of God. See, the definition of prosperity in the Greek is to move forward. It's to advance. But how many know when you're moving forward and when you advance, how many know there's opposition? When Nehemiah and the people were, were, were going back and they were excited because Nehemiah showed up with resources. Nehemiah showed up with permits. Nehemiah showed up with even an army. Nehemiah showed up with people and they got excited. Okay, let's do this. Let's build this. Let's get ready to do the work. Let's get ready to build the work. That's when the enemies rose up. Nehemiah didn't have one enemy. Nehemiah had four enemies. Four enemies, Samaritans, Amorites, the Arabs, and the Philistines. They all begin to rise up. How I many know sometimes you're not just fighting one enemy? Sometimes you're also battling within. There's outside forces and there's inward forces that are coming against you. But I'm here to let you know that the key is to be persistent. The key is to be persistent. You know why? Because persistency will always allow you to prevail. In order to prevail, you must first be persistent. We must be persistent. I know it gets discouraging. I know it gets hard. I know when you don't see it, sometimes you're like, I'll believe it when I see it. But the kingdom that we're a part of, it's a kingdom of faith. The Bible says walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not how you feel. Walk by faith. Every day you're walking in faith. Yes, you feel God's presence, but by faith you're able to access God's power. You may not always feel good. You may not always feel this peace that you felt this morning. That's why you got to walk by faith. You got to walk by faith. Because as soon as we're out of his presence, we still have his power. His presence produces his power within our life. You're not always going to feel joyful. You're not always going to feel motivated. You're not always going to feel peaceful. But by faith, you're pressing forward. By faith, you're moving forward because you know that the power of God is in you. And even though you're surrounded by the enemy, you know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know that you're more than a conqueror. You know that you're the head and not the tail. You know that God is making you the strongest in the land. He prayed. He planned. He was persistent. He prayed. He planned. He was persistent. Say it with me this morning. He prayed. He planned. He was persistent. He prayed. He planned. He was persistent. That's the key. That's the key. Because when you're persistent, you can prevail. You can prevail. In order for us to walk in victory... Sometimes we have to identify the enemy. To hit your target, you have to know where you're going. You have to be able to identify the enemy. Even though the walls were destroyed for over 150 years, even though Jerusalem was vulnerable for over 150 years, with prayer, with planning, with a little bit of persistence, they accomplished the work in less than two months. With a little bit of prayer and some planning and some persistence, they did the impossible. They did what was beyond their own ability. 
Zechariah told him, I will save you. God is going to save you, but he's not just going to save you. You're going to be a blessing. When you're prepared, you're a blessing. When you're not prepared, you know what I'm talking about. When you're prepared, you're a blessing. When you're not prepared, don't look at people. Come on, somebody. We're looking at ourselves this morning. How many want to be a blessing? Come on, how many want to be a blessing? Come on, how many are, know that our church is called to be a blessing? How many know God's people are called to be a blessing? How many know God wants to prosper you to be a blessing? God wants to strengthen you to be a blessing. The harvest is coming so you can be a blessing. The resources are coming so you can be a blessing. Increase peace. Increase favor. Increase harvest. Does anybody believe it this morning? That's your word. That's your promise. Let's get a hold of it this morning. Because when those things are released over your life, you will be a blessing. He prayed. He planned. He was persistent. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. This morning as we stand, I want to encourage you, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. Moments sometimes come unexpectedly. But the prepared are ready for their moment. First time I signed up for organized sports, they handed me a playbook. I had a hard time with that playbook. Our first game, coach calls me. He goes, I want you guys to run this play. This is the play. So I run in, I tell the defense, this is the play. As soon as the ball gets hiked, the quarterback does a little switch reverse. Running back runs right past me. Coach pulls me out. He said, what happened? He said, coach, to be honest, I forgot the play. He looked at me. He said, you missed your moment. You missed your moment. He said, I knew they were going to run that play. I knew they were going to run that switch reverse. They do it all the time. You missed your moment. Oh, you better believe I got that playbook. You better believe I began to study that thing day and night. You better believe I began to plan. You better believe I began to get... Get in that book. To get ready for my moment. To get ready for my next moment. Nehemiah was ready for his moment. I believe many of you, you're getting ready. Your moment is coming. You've been preparing. You've been planning. You've been sowing. You've been believing. You've been declaring. But I believe also there's many of you that have been so focused on what was it, what's in front of you that you can, might possibly miss what God has for you. You know what the people of God needed? All they needed was just to be refocused a little bit. To take their eyes off their circumstance, to take their eyes off the ruined walls, to take their eyes off of the ruined homes and the ruined temple, and to be to just refocus on the king. And what did Haggai say? Because it was Haggai and Zechariah both encouraging the people. Haggai says, The glory of the latter house will be greater 
than the former house. He said the glory of the latter house. He said God has something better. God has something greater. Yes, you've been going through things. Yes, you've been facing challenges. Yes, you've been preparing. But God is saying, I have something better. I have something greater. The glory of the Lord. God only progresses. God only moves forward. God only takes his people higher. God only takes his people, people deeper. God only takes you farther than what you can conceive. Forget about yesterday. He's doing a new thing. Do you not see it? It's an adjustment sometimes in our focus. When you're able to make that adjustment, you're able to pray. You're able to plan. You're able to be persistent. I believe God is raising up some Nehemiahs in this place. Come on, I believe God is raising up some builders once again. In this I believe God is raising up some people once again that are saying, I'm just not anticipating, but I am preparing. If that's you, I just want you to lift up your hands. I want you to begin to talk to the king. Nehemiah just talked to the king, and the king gave him everything that he needed. Just talk to the king. There's power in your prayer. There's power when you begin to release your declaration. There's power when you begin to release the word of God. When you begin to activate his word. There's power. So begin to talk to the king. Some of you, come on. You got to pray some courageous prayers. God, make me bold. God, make me strong. God, fill my life. Fill my cup. God, expand my territory. Enlarge my life. Come on, let's get courageous this morning. We are his people. This is our time. This is 